Well, good morning and welcome. We're so glad to have you joining us, whether you're live or watching this recorded later today or another time. Perhaps you're a person who has been invited in by a friend. We especially welcome you as we uh, open God's Word this morning. Would you join me in prayer uh, right where you are? Lord, it says in Psalm 27, the Lord is the light of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You are the strength of our lives. You are our hope. And whether we know you well or are just finding you or just seeking you, Lord, help us because we do need strength in this time. Whether it's economic problems or health problems, whether it's fear, anxiety, whether it's isolation, we find ourselves uniquely in need of resources that, frankly, we haven't sought perhaps ever in our lives. So as we seek you, may you be found by us. And you made that promise. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. So may all good-hearted seekers this morning find that you yield to their efforts to find you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to uh, continue a message series on the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we're going to be seeing three things. We're going to see in this passage the peril of the judgmental, the promise of prayer, and the folly of the crowd. Now, we're going to begin with the peril of the judgmental, and if you have a Bible, you can turn along with me as I read this from Matthew chapter 7, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. We'll be coming back to these passages, so if you have your Bible, keep it open. So again, this is Matthew 7, 1 through 6. These are fairly familiar words. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, hey, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Verse 6, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is God's word. So what happens here, of course, is Jesus begins by telling us not to judge. Now, here's something that I think you will see preachers do a lot. We'll say something like, we'll read that and we'll say, well, Jesus isn't saying, and then we go on to say he isn't saying exactly what he's just said. He's clearly saying, don't judge. So what does he mean by that, and why is he saying it? Well, he's saying that we shouldn't judge because the same way we act toward others is going to come back on us, and people are going to treat us in that manner. So let me just talk to the Christians in my audience, and I know there are many Christians in my audience, but perhaps this link has been sent to you by a friend, and you're still kind of a seeker looking from the outside in. So let me speak to the Christians for a little bit. When those outside the church are hard on us as Christians, the principle that Jesus is teaching here is coming true. Because when we have been harsh and judgmental toward other people, We deserve their scorn. Now, allow me to use an area or an example from the world of sexuality. I say this because this is an area which, at times, Christians have shown harshness. As a matter of fact, it's really the area of sexual ethics that's been such an area of sharp divide between Christians and those who aren't Christians over the last few years, and we're all very aware of that. Uh, Some of you who know me know that I did my doctoral studies that I finished in 2018 in the area of sexual ethics, so I've given this quite some thought. And it was about uh, a month ago, Trinity Seminary down in Ambridge hosted a uh, guest speaker for a seminar, and his name is Mark Yarhouse. And now Yarhouse um, wrote this book I'm going to hold up to you. He's a professor of psychology at Wheaton College in uh, Illinois, and uh, the book he wrote that I'm going to show to you is called Understanding Gender Dysphoria. He's looking at gender dysphoria uh, from a Christian perspective. and The subtitle is Navigating 
gender issues in a changing culture. Now, the book really helped me to look at those who are experiencing gender dysphoria, frankly, with a compassion I didn't used to have. I mean, what if your issue was that you were a man who all your life has felt like you're not of the male gender? I mean, I don't have that feeling. I mean, you know, we're told by, you know, that there are studies that 1 in 11,000 men and 1 in 30,000 women genuinely have this gender dysphoria. Now, Yarhouse did a study that was published in a Christian counseling journal where he and uh, other researchers asked 32 people experiencing gender dysphoria what kind of support they would have liked from their church because this was a population of Christians. And here's what one of them answered. They said, someone to cry with me rather than just denounce me. Hey, it's scary not to rescue someone from cancer or schizophrenia or gender dysphoria, but learn to allow your compassion to overcome your fear and repulsion. Now, you know, there's a variety of ways people who uh, have this issue of gender dysphoria can kind of treat it, everything from the more radical kind of surgical approaches to hormonal approaches. But what Yarhouse said is that people who feel this immense sense of the word is dysphoria, but this unease about who they are in, this, in their bodies will sometimes use some small markers that they will use to um, kind of ease that pain. And they'll do something like wear a piece of uh, a man who's uh, feeling this might wear a piece of women's jewelry, and that actually eases his pain. Um, I was out shopping a couple of weeks ago, and when I went to check out, there was a very masculine-looking man. I'd say that I say that because he had a beard, and. Uh, then I noticed he was wearing, you know, not kind of uh, a male kind of earring, but a very uh, feminine kind of earring, and that he had red nail polish on. Now, I have to admit that in the past, I probably would have been judging him. But because of what I've learned about those who struggle with gender dysphoria, my feeling wasn't judgment, but honestly, I, I felt compassion. I thought, what's it like to feel like this person feels? Now, let me just show you how Jesus paints this picture on the matter of judgment. I'm back in verses 3 through 5. He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I mean, you see what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, you know, we, are, we can all be about um, the speck in the, our brother's eye, saying, you're wrong, you're sinning, maybe even you're filthy, but we give ourselves a pass. You know, I remember about 35 years ago, I was uh, in seminary, and I had a wonderful professor of Hebrew uh, named Gordon Eugenberger. He, he was just a brilliant guy, and... Uh, he went on to be my field education supervisor, which meant he was mentoring me, and it was a real honor to be mentored by him. He was just such a great teacher, preacher. He went on to be pastor of Park Street Church in Boston and a, a teacher of uh, Hebrew at Gordon-Conwell, and just a remarkable guy. And uh, I remember, you know, when you remember messages or points from messages from 35 years ago, you know that the point that was made was, was insightful. And I remember that he was talking about this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, and he uh, taught a lesson that I've never heard anybody else teach, and I never forgot it. He said, if you look at a speck of wood in another person's eye, that what you're seeing, obviously a speck of wood that could fit into someone's eye has to be very small, right? So when you look at that person's eye, you see something that look, looks very small. Now, if you take, you know, I have here a small speck of wood, and uh, probably bigger than we might find in our eye, although maybe if you're a woodworker, something like this, might fly into your eye and you'd immediately have to get it out, but it, it's big enough that you can see it. But here's what I notice about it. If I hold it out about the distance that I would have you at, or in this day of social distancing, if I could hold it out to that six foot distance that you and I are observing these days, you know what? It really looks very small. As a matter of fact, if it got 10 feet away, I'd say, boy, that's really small. If it got 20 feet away, I'd say, is there something in your eye? Seems to be a speck in your eye. But then if you came within 10 feet, I'd say, wow, that's a pretty sizable piece of wood in your eye. And then if you got to six feet, our social distancing uh, parameter, you'd say, whoa, you've got a piece of wood in your eye. 
But then when I take that piece of wood and I bring it into my own eye, oh my gosh, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if I put it up against my eye, you know what? The closer it gets, the bigger it gets until it is the size of a, gosh, you know what? It's the size of a plank of wood. And what Gordon was saying is, our flaws aren't really that different in scale. But when I look at yours, it looks like a speck. When I look at mine, that same size speck is enough to obscure my vision so that I don't have the ability to help you with yours. Because I haven't said, let me take that similar issue out of my life so that I can help you with the issue that's in your life. I said a moment ago that I did my studies on sexuality. You know, you have to read many, many things when you're doing a doctorate, and uh, I read many, many books. But I remember the moment I read an article by Andy Crouch, and I'm actually going to ask the team to put a link to it because it's very good. Um, it's a very good read on this issue of sexuality. And he's saying our sexuality for Christians is always bound up in our bodies. And he makes that argument. But I never forgot a quote, and I included it in my paper, and I want to share it with you today, so let me just put this up. And here's what he says. He says, our yearnings, especially those bound up with our sexuality, are hardly ever fully satisfied by the biblical model of one man and one woman yoked together for life. Every one of us is a member of the coalition of human beings who feel out of place in our bodies east of Eden, meaning after the fall in the garden. And every one of us has fallen far short of honoring God and other human beings with our bodies. Now, do you know what God won't tolerate? He doesn't tolerate it when people who are drawn to illicit images on the Internet harshly judge people who are struggling with gender dysphoria. And he doesn't like it when people who secretly lust after the models in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue are harshly critical of those who are trying to manage same-sex attraction. But when we face our own, to use Crouch's words, out of placeness, when we acknowledge that piece of wood, that flaw in our own eyes, then we're able to help gently those who have a speck in their own eyes. I know I've used Mr. Rogers as an example. I have to tell you, uh, growing up, we weren't a Mr. Rogers uh, neighborhood uh, family. I didn't get it. You know, I would see it. It just seemed so simple. Uh, but obviously, he's come into quite favor uh, more recently as people have come to appreciate uh, him as the person he was and the remarkable person he was with both the Tom Hanks movie and the, the one also that was a documentary, both of which are great to see. Uh, since Fred Rogers went to my college, to my alma mater, Rollins College down in Florida, um, I got this magazine, as we do, from uh, our you know, colleges as alumni, and it says Rollins, and it says the king of kindness, and someone has painted him here and, and then painted him on the back with one of his iconic sweaters. And uh, what was interesting in this particular edition of the uh, alumni magazine was they got together people who had known Fred Rogers, and there were just these pithy quotes about his life. And some of them were funny, and some of them were poignant. Um, but one that was interesting was from Fred's son, John Rogers. And here's what he said about a time when uh, a child took advantage of him as a little boy. John Rogers says, Dad was so kind, he could easily make you feel like crawling under the carpet for doing something wrong to someone. You can imagine that, right? Imagine Mr. Rogers confronting you about doing something wrong. <laughs> John goes on. He once heard that, the, that a guy had swindled me out of a little money. Dad invited him to come over. Didn't yell at him. He just said, I feel bad for you that you want to do that to my son. And John concludes, he just melted. You see, it's all about how we approach people and how we kind of face our own junk that allows us to help other people. When you know your own flaws, your own little piece of wood in your eye, then you become the kind of person, Jesus is saying, who can help other people with the issues they have. Just like Mr. Rogers' kindness allowed him to speak to people in a unique way. 
So when Jesus says don't judge, he's not saying don't make distinctions. And we know that because of what he's going to say next about making distinctions. But he's saying don't think you can judge someone else and give yourself a pass on the issues that you have. That is hypocrisy, and God hates it, frankly. Let me quickly look with you at what Jesus says next because it's kind of uh, unusual. He says in uh, chapter 7, verse 6, Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they, will, they, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. It's obviously a curious passage. He's saying that there comes a point in the process of us as people who believe, sharing with groups or communities or individuals who don't believe, who are so adamantly against what we're saying, who are so dismissive of it, he's saying that we are to stop offering, offering it. Now, when he uses this, these phrases, do not uh, give to dogs, you know, there are distinctions in the kind of dogs that are referred to in the New Testament. There's that scene where Jesus says, you know, we don't throw the crumbs to the dogs with a woman, a Gentile woman who comes to uh, ask for something from Jesus, and Jesus calls her a dog. Well, that's like a puppy dog. This is not that kind of dog here. That would have been a domesticated dog that would have received a family's love. Um, here he's talking about the kind of dogs that roam the streets of cities in the third world as we might see them. You know, ravenous, scavenger kind of dogs that are dangerous and uh, often aggressive. That's the kind of dog he's using, uh, he's describing here. And the pigs, of course, were seen as terribly unclean animals. And he's describing a situation where you throw some pearls to pigs and they think maybe they're pea pods or, or acorns or something, and they go to eat them, and then they realize they're not, you know, something digestible, and uh, so they trample them under their feet, under their, yeah, under their little feet, and then they kind of turn on you. That's the picture he's painting. So Jesus is saying there are times when we say, I'm going to give up. And there were times when Jesus gave up and when Paul gave up. For example, Jesus was very patient with Thomas and Peter, but he had not a word for Herod. Not a word for Herod. He pronounced a curse on Capernaum, whose people failed to take his message to heart. And he instructed his disciples to leave places, I'm sorry, places that would not receive his message of hope. He said, take the dust off your feet. So there apparently comes a time when we who carry the good news turn away and leave people to God. Because continuing to present the message is dishonoring this pearl of great price, this priceless, great message of grace. And we say, okay, I'm going to leave you to God. Now let's continue with our passage with the second lesson, which is the promise of prayer. Now here we look at Matthew 7, 7 through 12, and it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, or to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. So he basically lays out this threefold recommendation. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. But um, let's just uh, level with each other on prayer. It doesn't work the way we want to, does it? You know, I ask, I get. I seek, I find. I knock, the door is instantly open to me. I mean, that would be nice. I think most of us would like that. But if that's what we're looking for, and I'm not being hard on you. I'm being hard on me, too. What we're looking for really is not God. We're looking for a genie. We're really looking for a genie that will give us everything we want. And here we're dealing with not a genie, but with God. And here's the thing, at least, that I have found with prayer. Let me put this up for you. It seems to me in my life that it's much more a process of changing me than it is a way of getting what I want. And I wonder if you've found that to be true. Because persistent prayer changes my heart toward God. Now, listen. I'm selfish. I'm sure you're selfish. We want what we want. And many of those things we pray for, maybe even most of them we would say are good things. Like let's say the healing of a sick, sick loved one. I can't imagine why God wouldn't want to grant that prayer and neither can you. But here's the thing. God has a bigger plan than, than what you and I see. 
It's just true. He has a bigger plan. He's doing a work to change my heart and make me less selfish, make me less demanding. And I'm a very demanding, controlling person at times. Ask my wife. He's doing a work to make me trust in his higher ways. He says, my ways are not your ways, nor my thoughts your thoughts. For my ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and your ways. And I say, God, I don't get your ways. He's doing a work to help me see that I'm not in control. He's doing a work to make me more generous. And persistent prayer does all of that. You know, I have the uh, really unique and uh, blessed privilege of walking beside a lot of people who are battling for the survival of a young uh, loved one. And there have been so many times when I've just been blown away when people will say about their child, and this happened to me recently, hey, we're praying for them, we believe she's going to be healed, but she's in God's hands and we trust him. And you see, that's what persistent prayer does. It kind of makes me surrender from saying, God, I need this and I need it now and I need it this way. And we say, God, I think I know what I need. I think I know when I need it. But you know better, and I'm surrendering to you. That's what God is doing in persistent prayer. He's doing good things in us. He's also hearing our prayers and giving and letting us find and opening doors for us. Now let's go to the final lesson for today, and I want to spend a little bit of more, more time on this. This is the folly of the crowd in a very famous passage. I want to take a very careful look at uh, this part of Jesus' sermon because it goes so radically and completely against the spirit of our age. Let's build it together. So first we'll read it, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And so let's build this out into um, a kind of a diagram here. And so he's talking about four different pictures here. Gates, roads, crowds, and destinies. And as you look at those, there's two gates. One's narrow and one's wide. There are two roads. Again, using the same word, one is narrow and one is broad. The two roads. There are two crowds. One is a crowd of few and the other is a crowd of many. And finally, there are two destinies and they are the destiny to life and the destiny to destruction. Now, our age finds this teaching of Jesus terribly repugnant. I know people who are not followers of Jesus because of this teaching of Jesus exactly on this point, and some of you are likely in that group. And the narrow road is narrow because it's hemmed in by what God has revealed in Scripture to be good and true, as John Stott has put it. And I think we could probably all agree that the narrow road is the hard one to follow, C.S. Lewis uh, articulated what he perceived as the relative easiness of the broad road. He tells in his autobiography how, as a 13-year-old schoolboy, he started, in his words, to broaden his mind. Here are his words. I was soon, in the famous words, altering, I believe, to, one does feel, and oh, the relief of it. From the tyrannous noon of revelation, I passed into the cool evening twilight of higher thought, where there was nothing to be obeyed and nothing to be believed except what was either comforting or exciting. But the man who said he was the son of God and came back to life after three days in a tomb said these words. He said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Moses saw that when you learn that you have to deal with a God not of one's own imagination, who you can make be kind of anything, but a real God, there are really only two alternatives. And here's what he said in Deuteronomy. See, he said this to a group of people, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, blessings and curses. Now choose life. On another occasion, Jesus was asked about the number of people who would be saved occurs in Luke 13, verses 22 through 25. Let me read it. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort. Now, he doesn't really answer the question. He was exasperating that way sometimes. He says in verse 24, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. 
Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, please open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. There will be a time when those who haven't entered through the narrow door aren't going to be able to get in. Now let me go back to my summary of this passage. We looked at two gates, two roads, two crowds, two destinies, and we contrasted them. But what I want to show you here is that of the two gates, narrow and wide, Jesus says there's no other gate. Of the two roads, the narrow and the broad, there's no middle road. Of the two crowds, the few and the many, there's no neutral group. And of the two destinies, life and destruction, there's no alternative. No alternative. Take a look at what John Stott said about this. Everybody resents being faced with the necessity of a choice, but Jesus will not allow us to escape it. He will not allow us to escape it. Go on back to that chart so we can just kind of reflect on it a little bit. I know that there are some of you watching this who are headed through the wide gate, walking on the broad road, part of the crowd of many whose destiny is destruction. And someone may have sent you a link to this service because they're concerned about you. Maybe you've told them that you're experiencing some fear and anxiety and uncertainty. And they want you to experience an awakening and reset your course. You know, 41 years ago, um, someone told me that God actually wanted me and his family. I couldn't believe it because I really couldn't imagine that he would want me. Then he told me what I really already knew, that I'd gone my own way and created a separation between me and God. He talked about a verse in Isaiah that says, your sins have separated you from your God so that he will not hear you. I can still remember that first time that passage dawned on me, and I thought, wow, I'm separated from God. Then he told me that I could turn from doing my ways and um, you know, living my way and start doing things God's way. And he said, all those things you've done your way, God sent his son Jesus to die for them, to pay for them, so that you don't have to. And then he said, you can go on from now on and follow Jesus, and God, by his Holy Spirit, will come inside you and help you to do that. And so at that point, at the age of 22, I got off the broad road and reset my destiny. Now listen, I don't want to get sick and die, but I'm ready any time it comes because I know where I'm going. I know absolutely where I'm going. I don't have a tick of doubt about it. And as I've talked to Christians through this coronavirus disaster we're in, I find Christian after Christian will say to me, well, I know where I'm going. I'm completely secure about that. So if I happen to be one who falls ill, I'm ready for that. Do you have that kind of an assurance? Because you can, and Jesus wants you to. He wants you to have that kind of assurance. Let me just review what I said earlier. This is really the message of the gospel that Jesus gave. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand, which is really a way of saying it's time for things to be done. It's time for things to be done God's way. And he said, with me coming, that has begun. You haven't been going his way, so you need to turn from your ways to his ways. That's what the Bible calls repentance. You have to believe the Bible, Jesus will say with the gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And the good news is that you don't have to die for your sins because Jesus did. And there's not anything you can do to pay for one of those sins except go into judgment, that pathway of destruction, or let them be placed on Jesus and paid in full so you can stand before God completely spotless and then spend the rest of your life saying, God, help me to follow Jesus. That's the gospel, friends. So I don't know where you are. You know, we're a church of several hundred, but uh, hundreds more seem to watch our videos of this service. And if you're one of those people, your life can change today. And you can feel a certainty about what will happen to you when you die, whether it's, frankly, in the next few months of something unexpected or even the virus, or whether it's not for 60 or 70 years because you're a young person. But you can live all of your life with the certainty that says, I know where I'm going when I die. I live with that certainty. I don't like the idea of dying, but I don't fear death for one second. I don't think I can remember fearing death since I was 22 years old. 
and I don't think I will ever fear it again. And that can be yours. Let's pray together. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. If you feel God's calling you to be secure like that, to turn from your ways to his ways, then pray along with me. Maybe you're alone. Maybe you want to pray this silently. Maybe you want to say it after me. So I'm going to go through it slowly. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I have done things my way, and I want to put that behind me. Because of your son's death on a cross, you can forgive me and make me completely clean. Though my sins were as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed my transgressions from me. And now give me the power to live the way you want me to. To leave behind all that disappoints you and doesn't reflect your desires for my life. Beginning now, beginning today, with your help, God, I am following Jesus. And God, for all of us who've been on the narrow road for a long time, or just some time, help us to leave behind judgmental attitudes. Let us be aware of the plank in our own eye and do what it takes to get it out before we speak with love to those around us. Thank you for your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.